He's an infrastructure engineer. Uh, he works on uh, infrastructure design and operational tools. He's been a software engineer, a DevOps engineer, and many other roles, uh, working with uh, many different software stacks, uh, many of them APIs. And he's going to talk to you about another HashiCorp tool, and that is Vault. So here's Mason with Lux to Vault. All right. Um, good afternoon. So my name is Mason Liu. Um, today I'm going to share with you a secret journey. Um, this journey is about how we move from a homegrown secret management solutions into open source. Now, some of the challenges and this design decisions that we encounter, as well as um, lessons that we learn along the way. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an infrastructure engineer at Grand Rang. Grand Rang is a company that is in the uh, um, health tech space in the San Francisco Bay Area. What we do is we try to match patients with the best doctors um, in your area using big data. Um, the team that I'm in, you know, we usually call ourselves as the janitor and the plumbers. Right? We're responsible for laying the pipes so information can go through them cleanly and securely. So you know, being in the uh, healthcare space, you know, this is a very, very heavy compliance um, um, environment so we have to deal with PHI and PII data on a daily basis. So for those of you who are not familiar with PHI and PII, so PHI is personal, personal health information, and PII is personally identifiable information. So in order to be you know, in compliance, the rule of thumb is you have to ensure your data is encrypted both at rest and in flight. Now, so how do we deal with you know, secrets um, that unlocks PHI and PII. Right? This is a question that is foundational to the company. Right? So the answer is really simple. You have to be extremely careful and almost borderline paranoia. Right? And this was the mindset the homegrown secret management solution was based on. Right? So on the um, you know, we run everything on, on AWS. So on the encryption side, we use a uh, a standard called Lux. Lux stands for Linux Unified Key Setup. It is a standard that we use to encrypt um, Linux, Linux, Linux hard disk. Um, and then all our secrets, they're all GPG encrypted on a S3 bucket. So when we bring up a new EC2 instance, right, we have a puppet module that that would create an a memory file system and then encrypt it using a random string. Once the encryption is done, then that string is, you know, is discarded. Now, when we do a deploy, what we do is you know, we first spin up an EC2 instance, we create an in-memory map, and then someone you know, using their laptop is going to pull down all the secrets from S3, GPG unencrypted, then create a set of bash files that looks something like that. And then we'll use a, a tool called Capistrano. For those of you who are not familiar with Ruby, um, it is just a set of tasks that you can define to move your applications onto um, an EC2 instance. So we'll use Capistrano and then push those um, bash files onto the encrypted volume. And then when the application starts, the upstart script will source the bash file, and then all the secrets will be available in, um, in the applications as environment variables. So this is you know, a really simple design. We have um, a centralized control that whatever we do, it is going to be locked into CloudTrail. Uh, whatever we do to the, uh, to the S3 bucket, those will get locked into the, the CloudTrail lock. Um, it satisfies the compliance, because if you look at the pipeline, everything is encrypted going from S3 onto the EC2 instance itself. Because we're using an in-memory map, um, in-memory volume, you can snapshot this. So when a box is rebooted, all the secrets are gone. Right? And then it works well for a while, and then one of the engineers looking at the workflow and thinking, is there a way that we can do better than this? Right? And the answer is, he's came up with a way that if we can somehow reduce the number of environment variable that we put in a bash file and then dump it onto the file systems, then we could you know, reduce the, uh, 
um, the number of files on the file systems, right? So what we end up doing was creating a microservice in the middle. So here we have a, a secret holder. Um, <clears throat> it is just like a, any other EC2 um, instance that we bring up. It has an encrypted volume. Then when we push the secret, we only push it up to the secret holder. And then the secret holder runs an Nginx that, is, that has a Ruby um, script in the back end, and it will handle the authentications between the applications and the secret holder. So on top of the applications, we added a new library that will do all the, the authentication handshaking and also retrieve the, the secret down from, um, from the secret holder. So now instead of pushing the secrets to everywhere, we only have to push it into one place, and then when the application starts, it will retrieve the secrets from the, from the secret holder. And then for authentication, we're just using something really simple, a, a pre-share key. Um, okay. So the advantage, again, you know, we reduce the number of secrets that we have to put on to a file system, and because the application itself is using a library, we're able to put default value um, <clears throat> in, the, in that abstraction layer that handles the authentication and also the secret retrieval. Um, it is still very, very simple. And then this works well for a number of years, and we start to see problems. Right? And here's a list of problems that, that we start to see, and then I'll go into to, um, each one in more detail. So the first thing is, as we're adding more services to it, um, we used to have you know, one single app that's really simple, and then we start to break it down into components. As an example, we have an application here that has a web interface, and then it has a bunch of workers running in the background um, on, a different, on a set of different EC2s, and then a, an administrator interface. Um, so those three components, they all have to access um, some shared secrets. Because we put this on S3, and S3 is not a file system, we end up having to replicate the secrets in multiple places. And this creates a challenge that you know, when a new engineer comes in and they want to modify a secret, and he would you know, modify one and forgot the other two. And we actually ran into a few cases like that. And the other thing is because of our tooling, you either get nothing or everything. So we don't really have a really um, granular control on what you can get. Um, and this later becomes a problem because one of the uh, one of the customers wants us to have separation of duty, which means the people who have ac right access to the secret, um, people who read the secret should not have the right access. And without solutions, there's no way we can satisfy it. Um, as our team gets bigger, um, in the past, when a person was pulling down the secrets, the chance of two persons working on a modifying secrets is pretty small but then our team get bigger and then we start to have remote people. Um, we ran into cases where two engineers were both writing, uh, updating secrets, and then they both push back up to the S3 buckets at the same time. So they end up overwriting each other um, secrets. So this you know, really discouraged collaborations um, between teams. And the other thing is the, uh, the audit trail. Um, even though everything that we do to the S3 buckets, whether we download, we're downloading it or you know, pushing it back up, it's logged in CloudTrail. Um, if compliance comes to us and they want to dig through the, the CloudTrail logs, uh, we have to write custom script for them to, to go through the, uh, the log. Um, we want to, our team wants to move to a model that would allow other teams to self-serve. So we look at ourselves as you know, enabler. It's of, being the persons in the middle doing all the work for other teams. And then the way that we do deploy is a little bit strange. Um, when we deploy code, we don't just deploy code. We actually s shut down all the EC2 instances and then bring them up again. Um, oh, sorry, not bring them up, but bring up a set of new instances, then we deploy the code. So our, if you want to update a secret, you will have to wait 
until the next deployment happens where we you know, kill all the EC2. So a deployment can sometimes take you know, between a week to two weeks to happen. So your update does not show up until you know, a week or two weeks later. Um, the other thing is the service, they identify themselves by using pre-share key. This works okay, but then as we have more and more customers, we, they want something that is more sophisticated than just using pre-share key. Um, the problem with pre-share key is it, it is a pain to rotate them. So whenever we have to rotate key, people just like, grumble and don't want to do it. And then lastly is, you know, if you look at the, uh, the tech industry, the attrition rate is at about 20%. This means every five years, your entire, organize, uh, entire engineering organization um, is, is gone. So this solution was written about three to four years ago, and the designer and the, implement, uh, and the developer, they have left the company already, and there wasn't any really good documentation left behind. Um, so whenever the you know, engineers need to look at this surface, they actually, want, they actually stay away from this surface, right? Because they're afraid that if they f um, mess something up, right, this is a core piece of our platform, and our platform will go down. Um, so this is a, a really, really bad smell. So we've been looking for, you know, a better and an easier solutions. So we start to look at a, a number of um, open source projects, including the uh, project called Confident from Lyft. We look at Vault, we look at Conjure, we look at Keyvis, we look at Knox. So we look at a bunch of them and then create a, a matrix of evaluation for evaluations. Right? We're looking at how difficult is it to implement? What is the ease of administration and maintenance? Right? And then for myself, I look at the documentation. I want to make sure that the project itself is active and they have plenty of documentations to help me. Um, other focus that we look at is we are trying to see if the new solutions can help us um, satisfy different customer requirements. Um, the, companies, the company is growing that we're trying to go after customers that are in the government space and then in the finance space as well as in consumer space. So their requirement overlaps about 80% of the time, but then it's always the 20% that are very unique to their space. Um, so eventually, we did a few POC, and then we decided to pick HashiCorp Vault. So the workflow here is we want to just drop Vault right into the middle and just get rid of the, the flow between the S3, the deployer's laptop, and then the secret holder. So we end up doing this. Right. Um, because there is already a layer that is talking between um, the applications and our secret holder, all we have to do is just make some modification to the library, to the abstraction layer, to make it talk to Vault as well. And Vault has a really nice RESTful API that um, you, know, you can just do a bunch of HTTP uh, requests and then give you some really nice um, response. And then we are we're not going to store individual secrets that are GPG encrypted in the S3 buckets. We'll rely Vault to handle it in the, uh, in the storage backend. So the implementation step is actually pretty straightforward. Right? The first thing you do is you rewrite the uh, authentication code, and then you set up um, some role and policies that dictate what you can, uh, what an EC2 can access. Um, and then we start migrating the secrets. We definitely leverage the abstract layer to make it talk to both our secret holder and Vault, and then we'll be running both our secret holder and Vault for a while in parallel, and once we feel com comfortable, then we start to deprecate and remove the, the code. So something really interesting with the, the Vault authentications um, that I want to highlight is when you have an EC2, you, put a, you, can, you can put a um, associated a IAM role or EC2 profile to an EC2 instance. Then when an application or EC2 wants to talk to Vault, the first thing it does is 
it talks to a service um, from AWS. It basically sends a request and asks the AWS metadata service to return an encrypted signature. Then you send the signature back to Vault, and Vault would contact the AWS metadata service to verify whether the signature is correct or not. Then once it is verified, it returns a token back to the EC2 instance, and then that's the token that you use to access Vault and retrieve secrets. So if you look at this, we have you know, the mapping is there's an EC2 instance profile. It maps to a Vault role. And the role itself the, in Vault is associated with a set of policies. And then the policies dictate whether you can you know, do an update, delete, or read, what kind of actions you can, you can perform on the secret. Right. So to have both the secret holder and Vault running at the same time, we're using a, a feature flag. Um, so originally, we have the source of truth using uh, as the uh, uh, source of truth being the secret holder. And then whenever an application pulls the secret down from both Vault and secret holder, it does a check to see if there are any discrepancies. If there are discrepancies, then we lock it onto the um, into syslog, then we'll go back and then fix the, uh, the discrepancies between the, um, between the two uh, secret holder. So when you feel good about the migration, then all you have to do is just switch the, the feature flag and then make your source of truth to be vault. And then you can deprecate your code. So just uh, a few pointers for a smoother trend, um, transitions. Right? Writing the code was actually the easy part. It only took us about three days to figure out the authentications and how to, um, you know, how to do the, the, the secret comparisons um, in the applications. The hard part was to get people interested and then get buy-in from engineering leads and managers. Um, so there was a time that I had to create a spreadsheet with all the secrets in there. And it took me three weeks to just keep nagging them and ask them to you know, look at if there are any parities between our environment, any secrets that, that, um, that can be deleted. And then definitely take small steps. Um, make sure you use feature flag. This is you know, one of the things that, uh, that really helps. Um, I end up having to do this migration five to six times. Um, because there are just too many discrepancies that, that we found. And make sure that you automate it. The first time I did it, I did it by hand. The second time I did it, my manager asked me to, do it, to, to just write a script to do it. Um, always, always, always have a rollback plan. By telling your manager that your code works 100% of the time does not fly. Right? Make sure that, that um, you know, give them assurance that you can roll back. Now, in this case, I'm using a feature flag. And then lastly, the project was slated for two quarters. The first quarter was to look, to, you know, look at different vendors, build a POC, gather all the requirement. And then second quarter was the implementations. But then toward, this, toward the end of the first quarter, um, sales told us that we need to accelerate our effort. Otherwise, our customers will not sign the contract. Um, so we end up doing the implementation instead of doing a, you do it in a quarter, we did it in a month. Um, so just be careful. Right, so once this is implemented, we immediately see benefits. So now we are having EC2 authenticate with Vault. We're no longer using the pre-share key, but using something a lot more sophisticated. Um, then we start to, to give Vault role to ECS task. Um, so for this, we're able to enable the team to move from you know, running our application just on a, on a VM, uh, on a VM EC2, to move to a container. Um, so where you know, that effort is, is undergoing. And for audit, because Vault, the communications between Vault is, is done through HTTP, and all our HTTP um, requests and response are locked in syslog. So that gets forward to a log aggregator, and the log aggregator has a much nicer UI that compliance can run reports on. So now our team is no longer 
in between the compliance and the reports that they want to gather. And in general, this is the direction that we want to move to, not just for compliance, but also for, for other teams as well. And lastly, you know, make sure that it's easy to do the right thing. Um, Vault has, uh, you can run Vault in container. So for developer, they can easily just pull down a container and then run Vault within their dev environment. So they don't have to come up with um, innovative way to figure out how to get secrets into our, our platform. And it definitely encourage people to collaborate more um, because of how Vault st structure the, um, the secrets. Now each team is only responsible for a subset of secrets. Um, and they will not be overriding each others. And also, we don't have any more secret duplications. All the secrets are controlled by policies. So for, for applications, you know, as long as the application has policy, has a policy that can access the secrets, it will, it will have access. Then, right, life was really good for us until it wasn't. Right, we were able to, to give more cap capabilities um, to engineers that we give compliance the tool that they could go to a tighter standard. We allow the sales team to go, to different, to go after different types of customers. Right, but after implementation, here's something that we learned. Um, after we got Vault working, in the sixth week, it stops authenticating with AWS, and we couldn't figure out why. So at the time, we're, we're, we were introducing Terraforms into our environment, um, so we're doing a uh, migrations from cloud formations to, to Terraform. And then we're doing upgrades for, from Ubuntu 14 to 16. And then we're looking at our Puppet package and decide to start to trim it down. One of the package that we trim was called the NTP package. Um, and it was not installed on the Vault uh, server. Because of that, the, cl the system clock drift. Once it drifts too far, you cannot authenticate with, with AWS um, anymore. Um, it took us about a day to figure out what went wrong, and luckily it happens in our staging environment. So, the, so we fix it and then immediately roll it out to our, to our prod and other environment. So make sure you install NTP. Um, the other thing is uh, take an effort to, to spread the knowledge. Um, at Grand Round, we have a demo day that we do every two weeks. So I have to do a a few demo days to show people why we are moving to Vault, how we're doing it, and what is coming down the, the pipeline. So make sure that you spread the knowledge. You know, I had to write internal wikis to show them step-by-step -step instruction on how to do updates to Vault. Um, so even with, with those efforts, people will still come to you for questions. Just think about your job is to reduce fear. Right? This is a core component of the platform. No one wants to screw it up. So the best way, you know, is to help people reduce the fear, and then once you feel comfortable, then you go take a vacation and see how that goes. <laughs> um, the other thing that we wish we did better was, was the, the Vault role and EC2 role associations. Um, in my first try, I just wrote a script that would output a bunch of Vault CLI command, and then I'll just run it. Um, that does not give a lot of transparencies to the team. Um, what I should have done better was to do this in a more codified way. Um, so Terraform has a provider uh, for Vault. So now, just last week, we just spent two days um, creating a Terraform uh, modules that would do the configurations in uh, the, the Vault configurations. And then the very last thing is really think about like, there is not a really good delineation between what is a secret and non-secret. Um, for us, you know, anything that encrypts PHI and PII data, those needs to be locked down. InfoSec should get involved. Compliant team should be involved. We need to have a very clear um, audit trail. Same thing for any vendors, user, user and password, username and password that Know, touches PHI and PII, those should be locked down. However, if you found feature fa flags in your secret management um, solutions, that is 
that's just wrong. Um, and also we have a, uh, so for, for, for gathering system metrics, we install agents on our boxes. Um, there has been a debate whether that API key to, for, the, for the agent insol installation should be in vault or should it be somewhere else. Um, so for your environment, really think about what kind of secrets that you want to put into vault. Because you know, fewer secrets means it's just easier to manage. So the key takeaway here is if you, will, if you want to build something, right, and the answer is, if you think about whether you really need to build something, if the answer is yes, you know, put down the decision, walk away, come back five days later, and then think about it again. Um, think about what is your, your company's core, core competency. Right? Um, are you here to, to, to build tool, or are you here to you know, drive business value? And then as an infrastructure engineer, right, we want to move to a self-serve model. We want to be an, the enabler. Right? We don't want to, we want to write tools so people can self-serve themselves. And documentation is really, really hard. So I've never met an engineer who would rather write documentation than code. So if you can, you can um, offload it to a vendor or you know, to an open source project, do it. Because you, the minute you, write, you start writing documentation, it's going to be outdated. And then think about what is a secret. Right? It is much easier to handle and audit a few secrets than hundreds of them. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you can hit me up at this email address. Um, I don't do Twitter. Uh, yeah, but if you have any questions about Vault, um, I'm around. Thank you very much, Mason. Thank you. <laughs>